Stephen Evans. Stephen, we're receiving uh, reports now of another building collapsing. That's right, Jeremy. A third building has collapsed. We had the collapse of the two main towers about an hour after the actual explosion, which was about 9.15 in the morning. If you wanted to calculate a time to cause maximum disruption, you would calculate that time. It's the start of the working day and perhaps the biggest, busiest complex uh, in the world. There were those two explosions. I was at the base of one of those buildings and it literally shook. Then people fled out, fled away. One of the problems, it seems to me, is that people didn't quite know how far to go. So then the emergency service is starting to arrive and the collapse of the building uh, happened, of one of the buildings, one of the initial buildings, happened when people were actually quite close to it. But you're absolutely right, we've now had this third building uh, falling to the ground. It is very difficult to imagine anything standing at the end of uh, it all in this complex of seven buildings. If you think back to the Canary Wharf bombing in, in the Docklands of London, for example, it was one bomb. One imagines that most of the damage was superficial, if you like, not to the structures themselves, to glass, to furniture. Looking at that scene this morning here in New York, it's hard to imagine anything surviving those two explosions. Is there, can there be any kind of rescue operation here, given what's happened? I can't imagine that there will be any kind of uh, uh, rescue operation. It's absolutely impossible to estimate the kinds of numbers under that kind of debris. 50,000 people, as I say, work in those buildings. But one of the problems, it seems to me, uh, and I was just alluding to it, is that the emergency services got there rapidly. There were hundreds of uh, ambulances and fire uh, trucks very, very quickly there. People assumed that the thing was contained. People assumed that there was uh, a series of explosions quite high up in the buildings and realized quite late, if you like, that actually the thing wasn't contained and the engineering couldn't cope with the force of those blows. So there will be high casualties from the initial attacks but there may well be casualties from later. I don't know if the lifts were working uh, or not, but I imagine there would have been people who simply couldn't have got down those 110 stories after the attacks. So, as I say, the authorities are now very, very wary indeed. They have structures uh, barely standing uh, amongst the four that are now remaining. So I would imagine that they're standing back and trying to make engineering assessments of what can be done. Meanwhile, um, in the rest of the city, there is an eerie calm here. Uh, I'm on Times Square. It's normally one of the busiest parts of this city. Uh, you can see it now. There's virtually nobody there. It's normally blasted with adverts. They've, by and large, been turned off. That's partly because the city's been closed so that ambulances can get from the World Trade Center to hospitals, but it's also uh, because people have simply gone home. There wasn't panic when those bombs went up. People were very orderly. There was fear in their voices. Their eyes were getting moist, but people weren't really screaming like you think they might have been screaming. But they've now had, what is it, nine and a half hours to think about this thing, and these things do take time to actually sink into your brain. There's a bit of anger about. The American networks uh, are talking about, they're using captions like the attack on America. They're using the words Pearl Harbor quite a lot. They're right. talking about incidents galvanizing action. Okay, Stephen Evans in New York, thank you very much indeed. We're joined now.